An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 3, May 20th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last session, I tried to provide a foretaste of the central difficulty of dialectical thought, namely that its concept of truth itself is not a static one, that dialectical thought has broken with the notion of the idea as something essentially permanent, immutable, and self-identical, a conception which has prevailed throughout the philosophical tradition since Plato, and which is defined as the ultimate truth in precisely these terms in the speech which Plato puts in the mouth of Diotima in the symposium. We could also express it this way, which may help to introduce the thought that must form the principal theme of this lecture, and to which we shall have to return again and again from a variety of different perspectives in order to respond to its challenge. We could say that dialectical philosophy or dialectical thought differs from traditional thought in the sense that the former does not hunt after some absolute first ground or principle. For the pursuit of such a ground ultimately involves the idea of the invariance of truth. And when philosophies of the most various kinds have constantly attempted to dig out some such first principle, the motive at work here is not simply the desire to trace things back historically as far as we can possibly go. For this quest for a first principle always invokes a certain substantive, or if you wish, ontological interest as well. One then, imagi one then imagines the first ground or principle, irrespective of whether this is understood as that which is logically prior or temporally prior, at least as something that in some way or other persists immutably and thereby essentially furnishes the key for everything that subsequently follows. The entire conception of philosophy which has prevailed in the West since Aristotle, and indeed this holds not only for idealist traditions but also for empiricist ones, is that of first philosophy or proto-philosophia, that is, a philosophy which offers certain fundamental grounds or principles, whether of being or of thought, from which everything else is supposed to flow in a necessary fashion. Once these original grounds or principles have been secured, we then can claim to possess the decisive answers to our questions. This is not to suggest, of course, that all of you have already engaged in such considerations, but I believe that, if you reflect for a moment and above all examine the need which would generally lead you to concern yourselves with philosophy at all, you will discover that this equation of philosophical questions with such first principles that need to be established appears self-evident. Now the dialectical approach has directed its criticism at this very point, and I might add it in parentheses here, that it is one of the signs of the degeneration of the second version of dialectical thought namely the materialist version, that this specific impulse has not been recognized and that matter as such, or the material conditions of social existence have now thems themselves been turned into an absolute first principle which simply needs to be secured from the start. All the talk of Diamat thus clearly reveals itself for what it is, namely as a propagandistic, a <laughs> propagandistic device since such talk has already negated the principle of dialectics, that the mere provision of fundamental principles is not actually enough for philosophy. Today I should like to take some passages from Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, once again from the preface, which is still the most appropriate text for introducing dialectic as a specific method, and to try and show you how this critique of a first ground or principle is presented in its original context that is to say, in the first great version of a dialectical philosophy. I shall read out a couple of passages from Hegel and then interpret them from a twofold perspective, attempting in the first place to render them intelligible to you, but also in the second place, drawing your attention to some of the consequences which arise from this dialectical approach to the idea of a first philosophy or philosophy of origins. Although I shall come back to this later on, I should point out right away, by way of qualification, that Hegel is an extraordinarily complex thinker in this regard, for while he is the first one to offer a really radical critique of the concept of a first philosophy, there is a certain sense in which Hegel also upholds the claims 
of such a first philosophy, namely in the sense that he identifies the full development and articulation of the movement of the concept with such a first principle, and, in, oh, and indeed frequently and expressly refers to Plato in this connection. But we shall return to this question later. Here then is the relevant passage from the Phenomenology, which is also one of the most celebrated passages in all of Hegel's work, and one which can give you a certain idea of the essential character of dialectic. The true is the whole, but the whole is nothing other than the essence consummating itself through its development. Of the absolute, which can here be equated with truth in the emphatic sense, it must be said that it is essentially a result, that only in the end is it what it truly is, and that precisely in this consists its nature. Though it may seem contradictory that the absolute should be conceived essentially as result, it needs little pondering to set this show of contradiction in its true light. The beginning, the principle, or the absolute, as at first immediately enunciated, is only the universal. Just as when I say all animals, this expression cannot pass for a zoology, so it is equally plain that the words the divine, the absolute, the eternal, etc., and perhaps I might and perhaps I might perhaps add being to the list here, do not express that what is contained in them. And only such words, in fact, do express the intuition as something immediate. Whatever is more than such a word, even the transition to a mere proposition contains a becoming other that has to be taken back or is a mediation. Expressed in other words, the moment you take a word like the divine, the absolute, the eternal, a word by which you can understand absolutely everything, and indeed only when you do so does it fulfill that claim to absoluteness with which the word itself addresses you. The moment you explicate such a word through sentence or proposition, when you say, for example, that the absolute is what remains immutably identical with itself, or the absolute is the identity of thought and being, in that moment you already qualify that which precisely signified everything, and to which the pathos of such a word, its claim to absolute validity, effectively clings and in doing so, you alter the concept itself. You could also express this by saying that you can determine such an exalted concept as that of the absolute, the eternal, or the divine, only by qualifying or altering it. And this process of alteration is what is decisive for dialectical thinking. This alteration is not something external which our own reflections impose upon such a word or such a concept. It is rather that such a word or a concept drives us if we wish to comprehend it at all, that is, if we wish to give it any specific content through which it first properly becomes a concept, drives us to qualify in the way that Hegel suggests. At the same time, you have here an explanation of the principle of dialectic and an exemplary case of the dialectic developed with reference to a specific concept. Whatever is more, as Hegel says, than such a word, even the transition to a mere proposition contains a becoming other that has to be taken back, or is a mediation. The term mediation in Hegel always signifies change or alteration, which must be expected of a concept as soon as we wish to be apprised of the concept itself. We might also say that mediation is the moment of becoming that is necessarily involved in any form of being. And if dialectic is the philosophy of universal mediation, this implies that there is actually no being which could evade the process of becoming once you attempt to determine it as such. This is the Hegelian concept of mediation, and I would ask you to bear this concept clearly in mind, for we shall naturally have to recur to it constantly in what follows. And speaking of this mediation, Hegel continues, but it is just this that met with a horrified rejection, as if absolute cognition were being surrendered, when more is made of mediation than in simply saying that it is nothing absolute and is completely absent in the absolute. Now this horrified rejection which Hegel talks about is indeed that hostile attitude to dialectic, which we shall still have to confront for essential reasons whenever we attempt to understand dialectic. For it springs from the idea that if we fail to uphold our concepts unchanged, if we must change them in order to grasp them, if we insist in other words that their being is a becoming, that truth itself is actually dynamic, 
then this amounts to a dissolution of the concept of truth, to a kind of universal relativism that makes it impossible for us to say anything determinate about anything at all. Here I would say two things to you. In the first place, you will already have noticed one thing about the insightful Hegelian example that I have just presented to you. The movement, the movement of the concept which we have considered here, the attempt to determine a concept such as the absolute, the eternal, the divine, and thereby qualify it with regard to what it actually claims, namely to be something unqualified, unconditioned, absolute. This movement of the concept is not some additional contribution of thought, but is something required if you are to ascertain the significance of such a concept at all. That is to say, if you do not perform the operation which I have described, that is to say, if you do not go on to express a specific proposition concerning such a word, you cannot, you cannot ascertain anything about it. It is then something meaningless. And since the word, and since the word demands to be understood, if it is to possess its truth at all, this demand for change in the concept for this other dimension which you add to it in the predicate, so that it becomes what as the subject terms it is in itself. This demand does not spring from a merely sophistic form of reasoning which approaches the relevant concepts from without. It springs from the matter itself, if this matter is to be comprehended in its own right. But that means, and this compulsion is what essentially distinguishes dialectic from every form of merely external, or sophistical reasoning, that the movement of the concept of which we have spoken is not some arbitrary alteration, manipulation, or juggling of concepts, as many like to suppose, but something which arises of itself from the necessity of the matter. And in that sense, it is the very opposite of the, of the sophistical procedure, which precisely fails to pursue the inner life of concepts, namely what they require in and of themselves if they are to be understood, but proceeds instead to ascribe different senses to the concepts in an arbitrary and external way. That is the first thing which I wanted to indicate here at the very point where Hegel himself clearly recognized as his reference to horrified rejection shows, where the real difficulty provoked by dialectic lies in to suggest how we should respond to this rejection. For we have to see, to put this in rather drastic terms, that it is not we who bring concepts into movement. Dialectic is not the sort of thinking where we deploy concepts in very different senses in order to prove what we want to say. Arnold Gillen tells us, for example, in his work on anthropology, that the human being requires discipline in order to survive at all, and speaks of raising or education in this connection, arguing that human beings must specifically be raised if they are to survive the underdeveloped biological conditions of early childhood. But when he immediately goes on to insinuate the other meaning of training or discipline, as practiced by a martinet, this second meaning of training is not the unfolding of a dialectical movement, but is actually a sophism. But when we say here that I must qualify a concept such as that of the eternal, the divine, or the absolute, in order to grasp it all, to be able to think it, and then proceed to add something else through which it first becomes what it is, so that only through this change does it become what it is. That is a case of dialectical thinking, that is to say a movement of the concept which is drawn from the matter itself, and not something subsequently imposed upon the latter by ourselves. The second thing which I wanted to point out to you takes us back to the very beginning of the passage from Hegel, namely to the claim that the true is the whole. These days, of course, there is so much talk of wholeness, and the expression wholeness is constantly trotted out by school teachers, who imagine when they speak of wholeness and inveigh against mechanistic and particularistic forms of thought, that they have captured something of wonderful philosophical import. And thus I can only begin by warning you emphatically about the concept of wholeness, which has now become so popular. Thus, the task of philosophical education today, it seems to me, is to serve those who seriously desi desire such an education specifically by immunizing them against the countless philosophical slogans and ready-made concepts which swirl around us everywhere, and which people imagine can provide some kind of guide, norm, or meaningful orientation, while we refuse the trouble and effort involving, involved in thinking these concepts through,
and subjecting them to due critical examination. This kind of wholeness, this kind of organic unity, something basically unarticulated, which has simply come together spontaneously and is seen as inimical to the conceptual domain and to analytical thought generally. This is not actually what Hegel means when he speaks of the whole. When Hegel makes the famous claim that the true is the whole, a claim, moreover, which I have felt compelled for crucial reasons to criticize, although I do not wish to pursue this yet at this stage in our reflections, when Hegel defends this position, what he basically means is this, the sum of all mediation, that is to say the sum of all those movements which must be accomplished if our essential concepts are to receive their full meaning, this comprehensive interrelationship of concepts, or that which ultimately emerges out of them, is the absolute in question. And you may say, if you like, that this is the rather blunt, emphatic, and even drastic response, response which Hegel himself would make to the charge of relativism. But I should already say here that I do not believe that we necessarily have to take this step, and that we do not necessarily need to defend the claim that the whole is the true, if we wish to awaken the concept of truth in the first place, if we wish to uphold the concept of truth. You can readily see whether this is important or not, whether we accept this claim or not. For in fact, you can only really defend this claim if you also maintain that the subject and the object are identical with one another. Only if subject and object ultimately coincide, as Hegel actually teaches, can you say that the comprehensive sum of all mediations is tantamount to the truth, or the absolute itself. Just as in Hegel, the absolute is indeed defined at the highest level as subject-object. But if we have serious reasons for not accepting this, for not conceding that subject and object are ultimately identical, and there certainly are very serious reasons for not endorsing this extreme idealist claim, then you cannot rely upon the thought that the whole is the true because the infinite whole is not something which is ever given, at least to the finite subject. Or in other words, because not everything which is can be resolved into the pure determinations of thought. This is why the controversy which, attacks to the, which attaches to the, this highest principle of Hegelian philosophy, if you wish to put it that way, is of such extraordinary importance. But I believe, and this is the consolation, as it were, which I can offer you at this point, that this question regarding the absolute as the whole does not have the absolutely decisive say regarding truth itself. For precisely in that form of mediation itself, that is, in the negation of the individual concept and in the compulsion to go beyond itself, which the concept as such exerts, there lies a necessity. There lies a moment which already vouchsafes, vouchsafes truth, even if we cannot conceive of this whole, this totality, as something ever completely given to us. Perhaps I may add here that what motivated me personally to turn to dialectic, dialectics in a decisive sense is precisely this micrological motif, namely the idea that if we only abandon ourselves unreservedly to the compulsion exercised by a particular object, by a particular matter, and pursue this single and specific matter unreservedly, then the ensuing, then the ensuing movement is itself so determined out of the matter that it possesses, the character of truth, even if the absolute, as an all-embracing totality, can never be given to us. This would be the concept of an open dialectic, in contrast to the closed dialectic of idealism. And in the course of the following lectures, I may perhaps be able to give you a more concrete idea of such a dialectic. And here I should also just like to add that Hegel's concept of the whole, which is meant to be the true, does not refer to some kind of natural totality, that this Hegelian concept of the whole is not remotely pantheistic in character and is not conceived as some kind of unfractured organic unity. For this whole is actually nothing other than what Hegel understands by system, namely the entire and developed range of all the relations between subject and object, and the antagonistic relations between subject and object which are unfolded on their various levels. And then when you think all of these relations together, when you finally see how the simplest concepts with which you begin eventually return to themselves as concepts 
which have now been fully developed and critically clarified. Only then, according to Hegel, do you have what he understands by the system or the absolute. In other words, in Hegel, the system of philosophy is, in the highest sense, actually identical with being. But the concept of being here is not an enchanted word that stands right at the beginning and yields everything else. Rather, we could almost say that being, for Hegel, is a demand or program, something which only becomes what it is precisely through encompassing the entire movement of the concept. You could also express this thought in the following way, which is also just how Hegel himself expresses it, and say that the absolute is indeed the result, or that which emerges at the end of this movement, but then you must not go on to reify this concept of result in, in turn, as if, for example, at the end of Hegel's great systematic works, at the end of the phenomena, phenomenology of spirit, or the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, or the science of logic, this result can now simply be found resumed in a couple of summary propos propositions. That would still be a far too mechanical conception of dialectical thought, which indeed you can characterize as thought which resists both the merely mechanistic approach, which fails to surrender itself at every moment to the experience of the matter, and the merely organistic, organis, organicist, organicist approach, which simply strives to grasp some rational wholeness, where the latter turns into something blind because it is not properly thought and explored at all. Dialectic, in contrast, is precisely the kind of thinking which attempts to steer a path between the scylla of mechanistic and the charybdis of organis, organicist or organological thought. But to return to the concept of result, in Hegel, this concept should not be envisaged as something finished that duly emerges at the end, which we can then simply carry away. When Hegel says that the truth is essentially result, you must take the expression essentially result in its deepest and most serious sense. Perhaps from the inconspicuous example of this Hegelian phrase, you can get a clear and quite emphatic sense of the full difference between traditional and dialectical thinking. For the phrase essentially result does not mean that such a result springs forth as the conclusion of an extended method after a long process of considered reflection. Those philosophies which appeal to some origin or first principle in their various forms could also say the same. Thus, in a contemporary context, you may learn from Husserl or from Heidegger that extensive forms of epochy or reduction or even a kind of destruction are required in order ultimately to reach something truly reliable and absolute, namely a being or the ontological sphere of absolute origins. That is not what it is decis that is not what it is decisive here. I'm not sure that sentence makes sense. But when Hegel says that the truth is essentially result, this means that it belongs to the truth to be result. This does not concern a simple proposition or something simply valid for all time. It concerns something in which, as it is constituted now, its own genesis and origin, the process and the path which has brought it to this point is sublated and comprehended. You could express this, and here I base myself squarely on Hegel's text, by saying that truth is at once the process and the result of the process, that truth, whatever it is, emerges only at the end of this conceptual process, but that this emergence is not simply external to this process, that the process is sublated in this result, that the whole process itself belongs essentially to this truth and is no mere propodeutic that could then simply be detached from the result which you have now finally discovered and acquired. What the whole really means for Hegel, if I may try again to make this difficult concept a little clearer to you, is quite simply that truth does not consist in defining some concept, concept in isolation, treating it in isolation as if it were a mere sector, but rather by taking it in relation to the totality in which it stands. Those of you who are studying the sciences of society can form a really emphatic idea of this whenever you try and understand any specific social sectors. In the sociology of business, for example, any specific relations which prevail within a particular factory or within a particular branch of industry.
then you will soon encounter all of the determinations which have already emerged for you here and now, even though in reality they are not simply grounded in the particular place, the particular site, or the particular branch of industry which is the focus of investigation. For these determinations will lead back to much broader questions such as, for example, the role of the mining industry or the conditions of mine workers in the entire process of industrial production today and ultimately to the entire structure of society in which the industrial exploitation of raw materials is involved today. It is only if you reflect upon the whole that you will also be able to understand the individual aspect properly. Thus it is necessary to grasp individual phenomena precisely in their particular character, though without simply arresting our thought at this point, and also to extrapolate from these phenomena. That is, to understand them within the totality from which they first receive their meaning and determination. This is the most essential insight which is involved in Hegel's claim that the whole is the true. And I believe that among the most important reasons which may lead us to develop a dialectical conception of knowing in contrast to a purely positivist approach to scientific knowledge, this insight must take pride of place. But we must add that such recourse to the whole certainty or, or to the whole certainly cannot be an unmediated one. I shall also try and clarify this for you. <clears throat> For it is indeed entirely possible that one may try and explain certain social phenomena in a quite arbitrary and, let us say, external manner, simply by proclaiming, while of course that springs straight from the structure of capitalist society, or that derives from the level of productive forces, or from some thir certain things of this kind, but without showing how the necessity for this transition to the totality is actually involved and the specific character of the individual phenomenon under investigation. Yet, on the other hand, and this already holds for a society, let alone for metaphysics, the totality from which the whole is to be explained is not just given, in the same sense in which some particular datum or some particular phenomenon is given to scientific study or observation. Capitalist society is not immediately given in this way as an object of study, and nor is the whole accessible to us as a mere fact, like the relations involved in some concrete and specific field of industry. Thus, this transition to the whole, which the individual phenomenon requires, if it is to be understood, also always involves a moment of speculative arbitrariness, or to put this in positivist terms, evinces a certain lack of scientific rigor. And here you can study the intellectual function, the practical function of dialectic, in a particularly precise fashion. For dialectic, in contrast, is not an attempt to introduce the whole in a merely schematic or mechanical manner from the outside in order to understand the phenomenon, because the latter cannot be understood in its own terms. Rather, dialectic is the attempt to illuminate the individual phenomenon in such a way, to tarry with the phenomenon in such a way, to determine the phenomenon in such a way, that the latter intrinsically passes beyond itself through this very determination and thereby manifests precisely that whole, that system, within which alone it finds its own role and place. Expressed in concrete terms, this is the demand which dialectical thinking initially makes upon us. If I may put it this way, as naive seekers of knowledge, on the one hand we should not be content as rigid specialists, to concentrate exclusively upon the given individual phenomena, but strive to understand these phenomena in the totality within which they function in the first place and receive their meaning. And on the other hand, we should not hypostasize this totality, this whole in which we stand, should not introduce this whole dogmatically from without, but always attempt to effect this transition from the individual phenomenon to the whole with constant reference to the matter itself. But it would of course be naive to believe that we could actually arrive at the whole, whatever that may be, simply on the basis of the individual phenomenon if we did not also possess some concept of, the, of this whole already. In the phenomenology of spirit, this finds expression in the thought that there is always a double movement here, a movement of the object, of the objective concept on the one hand, and a movement of the knowing subject on the other. If I do not have some such a concept of the whole, some such a concept of the matter, or indeed ultimately an intention towards truth itself, 
Here we could almost speak of a practical intention regarding how this truth is to be actualized. And fail to bring this to bear upon the phenomenon, then the phenomenon in turn cannot begin to speak. I must have no wish to pretend, in a kind of dialectical mysticism, that the phenomenon would somehow actually speak if I am not there to listen. But the, but the authentically dialectical art, which you can learn from Hegel, lies precisely in this. We must allow the matter to drive us beyond the merely inert individual determinations, while we, mu while we must still retain the capacity, through the experience of the specific and the individual which we, which we have exposed, to modify that whole whose concept we must possess in order to grasp the concept of what is individual, to modify that whole in such a way that it forfeits its rigid and dogmatic character. In other words, the dialectical process is something which relates at once to both, to the parts, the individual moments, which we must pass beyond by virtue of the whole, and to the whole itself, for the whole, the concept which we already have, and which should ultimately constitute the truth, must continue to change in accordance with our experience of what is individual. There is no recipe for how this it how this is adequately to be accomplished, but then, it but then it belongs to the essence of dialectic that it is no recipe but an attempt to let truth reveal itself.